it sounds like what you're saying is there's lots of different symptoms, but they're all being treated with the same medicine, medicine that hasn't been shown to be effective in any single specific instance. So instead of focusing on treating symptoms, let's focus on preventative measures. If you have an economy based on capitalism, you inevitably have these depressions. They happen cyclically. So maybe the New Deal couldn't fix the situation because all those programs were just band-aids that didn't address the real cause. It's very easy and fashionable to say that, but actually depressions are not a natural feature of capitalism. This or that sector may go up and down, but system-wide collapses are foreign to capitalism without government intervention. Think of it this way. Imagine a master builder who has a blueprint to build a house, but he doesn't have enough resources to build the house that the blueprint calls for. So the longer he persists in working on it, the more resources and labor hours he wastes because the project will eventually have to be abandoned for lack of materials. The sooner he spots his error, the better. This is what happens with the economy as a whole when the Federal Reserve pushes interest rates down artificially. It gives entrepreneurs the idea that there are more resources available than there really are. The economy becomes too ambitious, embarking on long-term projects for which the necessary resources do not exist. We obviously don't want fiscal or monetary stimulus at a time like that, because that just encourages entrepreneurs to continue along this unsustainable path, rather than making them realize they need to abandon it and shift resources into more appropriate channels. Wait a minute, so you're saying it's like taking an energy drink and you're running around on that artificial high, but if you try to nourish yourself entirely on energy drinks with nothing else, you're going to crash and you're going to collapse. And that's what happened in the 1920s under Herbert Hoover leading up to the stock market crash. And one of the first things Hoover did was convene a meeting of big business leaders and urge them to keep wages stable, even at a time when prices are falling. To keep wages stable, you're basically trying to give everybody a raise during the worst economic downturn in American history. Not the best time for a raise, really. Right, because the businesses can barely afford to keep the workers they have at those wages that they're paying them when the prices are falling through the floor. So at a certain point, if those wages are kept high enough, everyone's going to lose their job because the business is going to go out of business. That's exactly right. And by the way, contrary to what most people have been told, Hoover did not sit on his hands. He had no problem spending money. He spent more on public works projects in four years than had been spent in the previous 20. His Reconstruction Finance Corporation gave emergency low-interest loans to failing businesses and then began to bail out the states, helping them pay for unemployment relief, fund public works projects, etc. And then let's talk taxes. The Smoot-Hawley tariff introduced tariffs, that is, taxes on imported goods, on over 20,000 products. And the idea was to have these taxes be so high that nobody in his right mind would pay them. Instead of buying a foreign product with these ridiculous taxes on them, you would just buy the American product, which could therefore be raised in price because you have nowhere else to go. Now, this disrupted international trade and hurt Americans because American trading partners retaliated when their products were basically shut out of U.S. markets. The Italian government doubled its tariffs on American cars in response to what the U.S. was doing to them. So American automobile sales in Italy fell by 90%. And then, just as the Depression is getting really bad, Hoover took the top marginal income tax rate and raised it from 25 to 63%. And then corporate taxes go up, estate taxes go up, gift taxes go up, as do taxes on cars, tires, gasoline, toiletries, electric energy, luxury items, bank checks, and even telephone, telegraph, and radio messages. So I might point out that at the time, his opponent in the 1932 election, Franklin Roosevelt, and Roosevelt's vice presidential nominee, Jack Garner, were criticizing him for this. Garner said Hoover is leading the country down the road to socialism. And Franklin Roosevelt himself didn't say, if only Hoover would spend more money. He called Hoover's the greatest spending administration in peacetime in all our history. So not exactly what you learned in the seventh grade textbook. 